So a long time ago, my wife confided in me that she'd always wanted a harp. She'd never owned a harp, never played a harp, never knew anybody that did play a harp. However, she wanted a harp. Fast forward 15 years, and we're approaching our 15 year anniversary. And I decided that she needs a harp for our anniversary present. So I order all the parts very sneakily. She doesn't know about them and they arrive in the mail. As our anniversary approaches, I become extremely intimidated by the process and put it in the back corner of my shop and promptly forget about it. The summer progresses. We have an anniversary. We've now been married for 15 years. Life is good. No complaints whatsoever. And as we get closer to Christmas, I realize I don't really have a Christmas present for my wife and these harp plans have been sitting in the back of my shop waiting for me to do something with them. And so I realize, what's the worst case scenario? I screw it up and it breaks and I make another one or give up and buy her one. So I cut out the pattern, glue it to some wood and get the process started. I chose walnut for the process because who doesn't like walnut? And my wife especially likes walnut, and I thought it would turn out nice. So I roughed out a few pieces of eight quarter walnut that I had, kind of laid things out in a way that the grain followed the lines of the pattern moderately well, we shall say. I did make some mistakes. Uh, I didn't account for a couple of things. You can't really tell in the final pictures and the final item just because, well, I'm a woodworker and I've learned how to fix my mistakes. Here's my obligatory turning on some equipment shot. Uh, ignore that poorly wired thing there, probably isn't quite the code. But it hasn't killed me yet, so I'm just going to leave it as it is. Of course, the uh, obligatory going across the jointer shot. The jointer is for flattening boards, for those of you who don't know. Not for thicknessing them. Here I have a little dog hole in my workbench so I can use it as a planing stop. I don't remember why I was planing it. Probably just to get those beautiful walnut curls and to show off my hand planing skills. I can't think of another reason. And maybe some artistic showing up in slow motion shots. There we go, see? Isn't that nice? Look at those beautiful walnut curls. I'm obviously a real man because I know how to hand plane. When building an instrument, precision is very important. And I needed to get to exactly an inch and a half thick. Here I'm a couple thousandths over an inch and a half thick. However, that will sand out and it should be just about perfect. So to attach the templates, I used a spray adhesive that you can see me putting on here. It's basically a, a contact adhesive and I just put the paper on where I wanted it, push it down, and then be irritated by it for quite some time because the surface was sticky and collected dust and was really rough and annoying. And when it wasn't dusty and annoying, it was sticking to my hands. So one of the critical things about building an instrument is the spacing of the strings. If the strings are too far apart, then they'll be uncomfortable and weird to play. So that's why I ordered the pattern, more so for the string layout than the actual dimensions. I just wanted that to be precise. Close-up, out-of-focus shots of hands changing bits is always artistic and appreciated, I'm assuming. If not, leave a comment below complaining about it, how stupid it is. And of course, drilling holes. All those satisfying little bits of walnut dust coming up. And a close-up, in case you don't know how a drill works, it's a little spirally thing that cuts a hole down into the wood. And then you move on to the next one and do it over and over and over. The advantage of a drill press over a hand drill is you get a nice perpendicular straight hole. Hand drills, if you're off with just a little tiny bit, you can't really tell, and then you end up drilling them in crooked. Whereas a 
drill press or a pillar drill as some people call them is perpendicular to the table and goes straight down and straight back up so you have a nice 90 degree hole. So I'm not even sure where I left off when I stopped filming this because I haven't looked. So the problem with filming some of this stuff for YouTube is the lack of desire to, uh, to film it all. It's a lot of work to film crap and so I got into the, my mind that I didn't want to film it anymore and so I did a bunch of steps and now it's kind of been interesting, we're in an interesting part and so we're back to filming it again apparently. So what I did is I'll show you here. Got the pillar, got the holes drilled for the neck and then these pieces of walnut here are for the sound box. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start working on the sound box. One of the most intimidating parts of this whole build was actually the sound box itself. And this is the reason why. You have multiple angles coming in to play at this point. You have the sound box leaning back at about a 15 degree angle. And then it also splays out at an 8 degree angle, which you can see here. Got this base piece cut so it's at the same angle as the upright parts. After that, messed around and got this little piece here cut. This is the top. And as you can see, it's got angles all over the freaking place. So that was a bit of a sketchy cut to make. Eventually got it all done. This dowel I turned down on a lathe to fit my Forstner bit. It's a one inch exactly. And then, We have this little dado here is where the soundboard is going to slide into. So the plans, they say a guy should glue it onto the top and then nail through it. And I didn't want to put a veneer tape on top of it the way the plans do. I think the glue is going to be strong enough, but I put it in this little rabbit. That way we got it on both sides. I don't think that's ever going to come out once it's all glued in there, but we will see. Of course, as you know, that's why you buy plans, right? So you can ignore them. Anyway, moving on. So I'm measuring out for the soundboard to go into those dados. And I used a aircraft grade finished birch plywood to make the soundboard. It wasn't cheap and I don't think it sounds great doesn't sound terrible but it's definitely not the most wonderful sound in the world the next harp i build since i've been told that i'm building another harp i'm definitely going to use uh, some proper soundboard material i'll use some quarter sawn or vertical grain fur i think is what i'm going to try or i'll try to find some sitka spruce maybe i'll order an actual soundboard in from one of the luthier supply companies but I kind of like the idea of trying out fur. There are some fur guitars out there. Uh, they sound all right. I can't imagine why it would sound worse than plywood, but we'll see. My wife likes it. That's the important thing. Here I'm cutting out the spot for the, the pillar to go through the bottom of the soundboard. It, As you'll see later, it, the pillar bolts into the bottom of the harp. That way it, it all holds together. The neck and the pillar are are not actually attached to the soundboard or to the sound box actually other than by the string tension and the single bolt down through the bottom of it. This trick here I use quite often. I just use some super glue and accelerator with some with some masking tape or some painters tape and that gives you a nice solid hold for when you are trying to get a straight line and then I just use that piece of MDF that I've cut square as my reference against my table saw fence. Works really well. This little strip is just to add a little bit of strength for the strings and I just shot a couple pins on there to onto the clamping calls to keep it nice and straight. You won't ever see them, they're, they're 23 gauge pins so the hole that's left behind is almost negligible. By the time I got it finished it was gone. I think I could probably find it if I was looking but, but nobody else will.
and of course I sanded it. Again, that's why I use the template so I can get that spacing. And back to the drill press again for some nice, nice square holes. And of course by square holes I really mean round holes that are 90 degrees perpendicular to the surface. The glue up uh, was a little more stressful <laughs> than I thought it would be, but it all came together pretty good. I did have to do a couple little pair repairs that I don't show to fill up some gaps, but I think we can live with that. Now we need to cut out the neck, cut it out on the bandsaw, and I need to glue this block to there. Anytime you're cutting something out on the bandsaw, you definitely want to stay away from your lines just a little bit. That gives you some room to clean up any uh, any mistakes you may or may not make. Since I'm a, I'm a glorious, perfect woodworker, I never make mistakes, so I don't have to worry about that. But uh, you might. Here we go, doing some dramatic shots of the glued up parts. So whenever you're making something, it's, it's usually better to reference the part rather than a measurement. That way you get a little bit more accuracy. After shooting some dominoes into the neck and the pillar, I was able to glue it up. These blocks here, just since it's, it's, it's such a, a funny angle to glue, I glued some blocks on as clamping blocks. That way I can get pressure straight across the joint instead of trying to screw around. Of course, I didn't let it sit long enough and I had to clamp the one block on to keep it straight, but them's the shakes. It all came together pretty good. And they just break and sand down clean really easily. I use the scroll saw to cut out the sound holes in the back of the sound box. And then it's time to glue it all up. It's a little oversized. I made it a little bit wider than it needs to be. That way I can come back with a flush trim bit and clean it right up to the edge. Because of the angles at the top and the bottom, it didn't quite cut right up to the edge. And so I had to hand sand it down flush a little bit, but that was all good. Then came time to clean up all those bandsaw marks and clean up all the cuts and start getting it assembled. Here you can see me putting that bolt in and a threaded insert is what holds it there. Just put some CA glue on to clean it up. And then we eased over all the edges with the roundover. I think it's about an eighth inch roundover so it's nice and smooth to feel. And then hand sanded the heck out of it for a while. Of course, as a router bit, you can't get into the corners, and so I used a rasp to kind of finesse the final things and clean up a little error and little mistakes and chip outs that I made in a few different spots. But since I'm making it, nobody needs to know. And the slow motion finishing shots. Cue the romantic music and all that jazz. And finally, back to the finishing drama, putting in all of the, the pins that the strings are tensioned against, getting them all to the right height and right orientation. And the tuning pegs. The moment of final assembly. It took forever for the strings to actually tension. I, I tuned them up as I was going and then they would just stretch out and they were just 
terrible for sound right off the bat. It sounds pretty good now, but there still needs to be tuned quite frequently. And my son's running the camera, so it's nice and uh, nice and shaky. Guess I can't complain. He was helping and he was excited to help. Of course, he's uh, leaving some commentary in the background. I might uh, might let that play. See, most of the strings are already done. And just these two last ones here that he's doing. Are you that sad that you're crying about it? That's so beautiful, Dad. Wow. I think it needs it to be needs tuned, to tuned. Some tears. <laughs> Well, here we are. The wife liked it. Here's some dramatic final pictures. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did and you're still around, thanks for watching. If you liked it, why don't you click the like, subscribe, all that jazz, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.